And when, the way that space economics work is that if the bigger your vehicle, the lower your cost per unit weight, basically. And then the, also the other thing is if you can reuse it, then that also radically decreases your uh, cost. And so, you know, when I was um, young, <laughs> it cost 10 to $100,000 per kilogram to send something into orbit, right? And, you know, SpaceX, I think, is now very close, if not below, with their standard launch vehicle, like $1,000 per kilogram. Mm. But Starship could push it like another factor of 10 down, so $100 per kilogram. You know, so like literally, you know, you could go to space for, you know, whatever, a few, th few thousand bucks. Welcome to the Curiosity Podcast, where we go deep on a wide variety of technical topics with the smartest leaders in the world. I'm Imad Akhund, the founder and CEO of Mercury and an investor in 300 plus companies. And I'm Raj Suri, I'm founder of Lyft and Presto Automation. And today we have George Whiteside, who um, ran Virgin Galactic for 10 years, was the chief of staff at NASA, invested in a bunch of wildfire um, companies, and now is running for Congress. A uh, really impressive guy, wide variety of of um, different areas that he's gone deep on and um, and difficult areas too. I mean, these are politics, wildfire, space. Um, really interested to talk to him. One thing I love about George is he's just very thoughtful about where the future is going and is very optimistic in everything he describes, even in politics where, you know, I'm a little pessimistic when it comes to politics, but he's clearly taking a take where he can actually like influence change and improve the world, which I really uh, appreciate. Yeah, it seems like no challenge daunts him, you know, like he's taken on these things before, like they became even popular. I mean, space he was working on way before, you know, the current um, boom and um, wildfire he's working on before. It's like become a big thing to work on. So, yeah, really um, um, interested to talk to him today. George, great to have you here. Uh, I guess first step, you know, give us a quick rundown on your personal history. Like, how did you get to where you are? Well, I like to tell the story that I came out of college in the mid 90s and i was kind of interested in a few different things and so i went to a friend of our families who happened to have recently been the director of the cia and okay. he's i explained here are the three things that i was kind of interested in um they were this new thing called the internet the brain and space and he said, well, you know, um, the brain is super interesting, but it's a little, you know, immature in terms of the tools that we have right now to study it, but very interesting area. Internet, not sure how that's going to be, but it seems like could be big. But whatever you do, don't go into space because there's just <laughs> nothing happening in that area. And, um, and he was actually right. Like at that but time. what year was that? That was um, like 96, 97. Okay, it was right in the sense that there wasn't like an amazing amount of, I would say, true innovation happening in space at that moment in time. Now, luckily, I kind of followed my gut and still went into space. And I happened to have been a part of this incredible journey of, you know, commercial space and innovation. And this just unrolled, you know. Over well, the I was going to say, I hope you picked Internet because, <laughs> you know, that was 96, 97. That was like the beginning, right? Was, uh, yeah, no, I mean, what could have been, right? You know, <laughs> yeah. but uh, yeah, I mean, anyway, so I, I basically chose space and, and um, I started doing, you know, commercial, proto-commercial space companies, which I can tell you about, uh, you know, funny companies that were trying to send a robotic rover to the moon in a commercial thing and companies that were using parabolic flights to impart people with the feeling of weightlessness but mm -hmm. yeah i would love to go into those but i guess like a lot of young people decide things and they end up going into like i don't know finance or something <laughs> much more boring like why was it that i feel like you had like three fairly interesting yeah. tastes like what kind of drove you to pick those three things well I, you know um i've been doing a lot of reading and i think like many people i wanted to you know be a part of something that was important and big you know and um i think honestly 
It's one of these things where like, I think any of those three could have been really interesting, right? You mm -hmm. know, um, internet is, you know, done all right over the last 25 <laughs> years. So that would have been interesting. Um, but, uh, but the brain too is like this incredible time to understand the brain. And um, yeah, I just felt like those were three areas where there was going to be something, you know, really significant to the future of humanity. I feel like brain, we haven't made as much progress, right? And the other, as much as the other two areas, it's, it seems like it's still like this um, unknown frontier, or, or, you know, it's like something we haven't really fully understood yet. And they're hoping that they can use AI to figure that out, right? Yeah. If you think about it abstractly, like AI is kind of making progress Modeling in brain, brain right? Like yeah. Kind of. Yeah. One, one person said to me that like, it's, it's like biotech in like the seventies, you know, before like all the tools were developed to really make super mm -hmm. rapid. So we're getting these proto tools now together, but, um, yeah, I think this century will be, we'll, we'll see some amazing progress in the brain for sure. So tell us about your, your journey, I guess, with, uh, with, uh, Virgin. Um, when did you get involved with that? I think you were first at NASA, right? So basically I did all these, I did these like sort of commercial entities. And then I did some nonprofit entities that were related to space, something called the National Space Society, which was um, is really interesting public organization of people trying to support space. But um, I would say things got really exciting when I went uh, to the Obama administration. I, I had uh, helped write a few policy papers for them. And they invited me to join the transition team, which is this you know, group of people that comes in right after the election, literally like within a few days of the election and tries to get the new administration information about how things are going and and what's most important. And so, you know, as part of that for the next few years, I was involved in something that was tremendously exciting, which was, you know, trying to encourage greater innovation adoption inside NASA, which is kind of weird, right? Because you think of NASA as like one of the most innovative things inside the federal government, and it is, but um, in the area of human spaceflight, there was the opportunity to kind of do more. And that was, that was the time in which um, this idea of uh, the commercial crew program was, was really, um, I, I would say, became the baseline for, for human spaceflight. The idea that you could procure commercial human spaceflight services was something that the Obama administration really doubled down on. And, uh, and I think a lot of the incredible innovation that we see now in the world of space was at least in part generated by decisions made during those early years of the Obama administration in which the decision was made from the president himself, like, let's double down on innovation and, and see if we can do things differently. And that has paid off tremendously for uh, the United States. There's lots of ways that the U.S. government, especially like military and things like that, work with commercial things. But there was something like about the decision that NASA made that actually led to like them working with new companies like SpaceX and Virgin. And uh, so what was it about like both? Why you thought this was the right decision and how it was constructed that actually like led to new innovation and new companies rather than kind of the normal government contractors? Yeah, I mean, you guys like going deep, right? So I'll, I'll, get, I'll go deep on government procurement <laughs> yeah. policy, yeah, which is not always yeah. like the most yeah, ex exciting thing. But, you know, a lot of the programs inside the um, human spaceflight um, sector up to that time had been based around uh, cost plus contracts in which there was maybe less of a motivation to drive down the cost. And that was super important in human spaceflight. Well, actually in all spaceflight, because like one of the pre predominant costs in any space activity is the cost of getting your thing into space, right? Um, one of the analogies that people use is that air travel would be pretty expensive if we threw away the 747 after we flew across the Atlantic each time, you know, and, and it's actually roughly comparable. Like it's order, order of magnitude, it's roughly the same cost to build a, a big rocket as it is to build an airplane. Can you define a little bit like what is cost plus and like why that even exists with like government contracts? Yeah, I mean, cost plus is literally the, you know, you win, you have a, a, co a competition, you know, and so you have a few different prime contractors say we want to, you know, we will we will respond to this government need um, for a service or a product or whatever. And the structure of the contract is we're going to count up all the costs that we uh, have to accomplish this thing that you want. 
you the government and then we're going to put a fee on top of it you know and it'll be a whatever an eight percent or ten percent or fifteen percent fee on top and it, and that's sort of contrasted with this thing called fixed price contracting right where um you know instead of saying we're going to okay add up all our costs and then put something on top um fixed price co- uh, fixed price contract is like you know is actually what most normal human beings deal with you know you go to the store and you buy a candy bar and it's a dollar or whatever and you know the companies can innovate on the cost of of that service you know um and uh the, the the reason why fixed price contracting is this is because a lot of these programs are are hard and you don't know exactly how much they're going to cost to achieve that would be the generous way of 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 talking about it um and um so but you know sort of get back to like the space thing you know how much it costs to put things in space is crucial, right? Like that determines a huge proportion of like what the overall cost of that service is. Um, and like from a big picture, if you do not lower the cost of space access, then a lot of the things that, uh, you know, might be possible in space activity are just too expensive, right? Because it just costs so much. And so if you have a, um, cost plus structure where people are not incentivized to drive down the underlying cost of the service of launch provide um then you know the game doesn't change right like that we're kind of stuck and and that's what we had seen in fact the cost of space access through the space shuttle program had essentially kind of gone up or at least remained steady um and that was a fundamental problem, right? Like unlike many different services where the costs are slowly coming down because of efficiencies or you learn how to do things better or whatever, um, the costs of space access were not going, going down. And so we thought that if we could, you know, potentially change some of these contracting mechanisms and also establish competition, which I'm a big fan of, particularly in uh, government services, um, then maybe we could start to, you know, bring those things that, are so great about them, the American economy, right? Like really good competition and and uh, and innovation. Then maybe that would have an impact on uh, the cost of space access. Because uh, if we couldn't do that, then our big space, you know, aspirations wouldn't wouldn't happen. And like I can get into what happened, but like the the headline is it worked. You know, yeah. uh, you know, yeah. partly due to SpaceX, but also due to several other amazing companies. Um, that cost has now been coming down. And what's great about that is that that's not really great in itself. It is cool from a space nerd perspective, and I consider myself a space nerd, but what's more important is that it enables all these other applications, you know, that benefit life on earth or that enable us to explore the solar system or whatever. It enables all this other stuff to happen, which is super important. And so was that initiative from the government itself? Like, hey, we have a goal. We want to like make space access cheaper. We're going to encourage private companies to like do this or was it kind of like driven by the entrepreneurial ecosystem? Like people like Elon were working on these things and uh, it kind of encouraged the government to look at it and say, yeah, maybe this doesn't make sense. Like how did that even, uh, you know, how did that begin? Yeah, I mean, it, it was really kind of a mix of both. Like I would say that there was a group of folks who were really interested in bringing more competition to the space sector um, who were outside of government, but who then started to feed those ideas inside uh, of government. And that was part of what did it. But then, like, it never would have happened if there weren't some at least nascent um, companies that were really doing things. Like, it was it would be hard to make the bet on commercial space if there wasn't just nothing there. And and so there was, you know, SpaceX was kind of early days, and uh, there were a few other companies, Orbital Sciences. You know, people were doing things, but they hadn't yet achieved. I'll give you an interesting statistic. So in two thousand. Guess what the proportion of the U.S., uh, the market share for the U.S. Uh, launch providers were on the international market? 10% well, maybe? Yeah. Roger, what do you think? 20%? Yeah. So zero. So we, we won no <laughs> oh, wow. launches uh, against mm-hmm. others because we had like a, a fairly expensive cost base. And now, of course, um, SpaceX and others are just dominating the market. You know, I don't know what it says, you know, over 70% or something, and maybe going north of that in terms of other metrics, like how much mass to orbit. 
Um, and I think this is a great American success story, right? Like mm -hmm. by doubling down on innovation and, um, you know, sort of wonky stuff like contracting, you know, procurement law or, or procurement rules, we were able to sort of shift the system into this really incredible um, rate of innovation. And, and like that has gotten me thinking about like other places where, where we could do this. Um, I don't want to move off space too quickly, but like, it is interesting to think about, like, how could we bring this kind of innovation to other other sectors? I think it's worth, I guess, like just finishing off this thread. Like what are, if you had to pick like another two or three sectors where like government could change things and be much more innovative, what would be like the next like two or three kind of options for you? Well, I'm personally like really interested in um, uh, wildfires right now. And um you know, the wildfire problem is a huge problem. It's it's a problem that uh, affects millions of people through wildfire smoke around the world. Um, and uh, it's a problem that's getting worse. And one of the interesting things is that um, uh, the agencies that are tasked, the government agencies that are tasked to uh, work on this problem um, are, I would say, by and large, they have less experience at developing applied engineering solutions. This is like forest management. Like what, what what area of the government like covered this? Yeah. So like the, you know, the main agency is the U.S. Forest Service. Right. And then there's also the Department of Interior. Um, and uh, and these are really natural resource agencies, you know, that mm -hmm. um, have have grown deep expertise in that area of stuff, but not so much like sort of like, OK, well, we have this need for a tool. And how do we achieve the development of such and such a thing? Like, I'll give you a couple of examples. So um, one of the things that's a really important problem in wildfire resilience right now is how do you do controlled burns on the landscape in such a way that they don't escape and cause much bigger fires, right? So mm -hmm. like, we can go deep on, you know, wildfire resilience as well, but like, the top level is that we probably need to bring more good fire to the landscape, which is what used to happen. You know, the, mm -hmm. the indigenous peoples and the native, native tribes would actually start fires at the right times in the year and bring sort of low intensity fire to the landscape and keep the overall fuel load. Fuel is just a word for like biological material, plants, plants and trees um, and keep that at a manageable level so that you didn't have these huge mega fires that we now see, you know, almost on an annual basis in the American West. And so one of the technical challenges that we need right now is we need to, in order to bring those forests back into balance, back into a healthy balance is we need to bring uh, controlled burns back into that, um, that ecosystem. But it's challenging because there's so much fuel right now that it's dangerous to do that. And so we need, in my opinion, we need techniques and potentially engineering solutions that would help us uh, to uh, do that in a safe way. The downside is if we don't do it in a safe way, you know, you can have these uh, escapes um, where, uh, you know, you have these really big fires. There was a big fire in New Mexico uh, last year from a planned burn that turned into this uncontrolled um, burn. The analogy mm -hmm. I like to make is that the people who are doing this planned burns are sort of like um, the guys who are defusing bombs, you know, mm -hmm. like, and it's just a very dangerous, it can be a dangerous operation in a high fuel op area because, um, you literally have so much fuel in the, the wildlands that if you, mm. you know, <clears throat> just are unlucky, like say that the wind comes up or, it, you know, some condition changes that you can suddenly have this escape. So we've been thinking a lot about how do you have technologies that could help, whether it's sensing technologies that can allow you to see and predict where a fire might get worse or even mechanical solutions like this, in, this incredible company called BurnBot, which is based in San Francisco. And they've got this a uh, system that would en enable them to sort of create a, 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 a pixel of land. They would burn a perimeter of, a, of an area of land. And then, and then they sort of, they have that safe pixel and then they can bring a drone into the middle and drop some fire in with the drone and safely burn that pixel. And then you can sort of like pixelate the landscape and have safer controlled burns. Anyway, mm. it's just one idea, but like we're gonna need more of this kind of applied engineering stuff to i think help us with natural systems problems in in the future and is 
is kind of government contracting and like all of the stuff kind of in the way or is it helping like is it easy for these kind of entrepreneurs to like sell their solutions it's uh, it's a great point yeah i mean it's pretty hard to be honest and um partly that's because as a entrepreneur selling into the government is really painful often yeah you know it's it's this just almost seems super... worse because it's decentralized as well right like there's a necessary yeah, yeah. Like one person you're selling it to her right no you have to go to like all these different forest areas or or forests and it's really painful so i think you know like there are ways that we can make that less painful and turn it into bigger markets and such that, um, you know, we can bring more innovation to the space. It's not going to be solved just by innovation, to be clear. Like our, our challenges are bigger than that. We also need really good forest science. We need, you know, natural solutions. We need all these different things. But like technical pieces will be part of the solution. And we should make it, in my opinion, easier for innovators to try to help. Maybe coming back to space. so. Uh uh i guess you'd had like a pretty broad look at space before you joined virgin galactic uh what got you excited about i guess their mission around space tourism and why we why did you decide to kind of pick that yeah and so like maybe just as an introduction like i'm not connected um <clears throat> to the company anymore but i was ceo for 10 years and then i was the chair of the advisory board for a couple of years which i've now stepped off and i think what excited me most was uh two things one was this idea that we would try to move human spaceflight more towards um, airline-like operations. And what I mean by that is, you know, high flight rates and uh, with reusable vehicles, fully reusable or almost fully reusable vehicles, like not throwing away the 747 when you fly it to, you know, mm -hmm. the other side yep. of the country. Um, <clears throat> that was part of it. And then the other part was, I, I do believe that that um, the perspective of space is important to humanity's future. The recognizing that we live on this planet with this thin film of you know life on the surface that's you know bounded by you know a few tens of miles of atmosphere is actually like a really important perspective for all of humanity to have. It's not going to solve everything, but I do think that bringing that experience to more people and having them then bring that experience back to their home communities around the planet could be a, an important piece of, uh, you know, support to solving the big global challenges that we have. It's interesting. I mean, so the, the primary business model for Virgin Galactic was space tourism, right? Or probably still is. For <coughs> yeah, still is. Yeah, still is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I guess on the surface of it, it doesn't seem like uh, there'd be that many people who would want to pay. I mean, you're probably charging quite a lot of money for these experiences. Um, what was the order of magnitude, like tens of millions or? No, it's like, I mean, it's still super expensive, but it's like um, a few hundred thousand dollars. And so that's very expensive for most people, uh, for me. Um, but it is, um, to be clear, uh, like a factor of 100 or more cheaper than other ways to get to space. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it's not exactly the same thing, you know, like an orbital journey where you're going into orbit around the planet is different than a suborbital journey where you're just going into space and coming back down. But you still get that experience of going into space and looking down at um, our home planet or looking at our home planet. And mm -hmm. so, you know, that kind of price change, you know, going from a ticket on, um, you know, SpaceX, they don't have a public price list but you know it's mm -hmm. been estimated to be around you know 50 million dollars or so um to you know say a hundredth of that or mm -hmm. you know two hundredth of that <clears throat> is exciting and you know a lot of these products just in general often start relatively expensive and then they go down in price and um you know the first flights across the atlantic were i think uh in real dollars like eighty thousand dollars um, if you adjusted it to today's dollars. And so, you know, and now you can get a ticket, you know, for 500 bucks or whatever. Um, so these things often start expensive and, and then come down in price. Virgin Galactic has this like kind of cool concept where they have a plane that goes super high in orbit and then drops basically another plane with a rocket attached to it, right? Uh, why did you decide that that was the concept for, for it versus, I guess, you know, doing a rocket from 
from Earth that goes all the way up and then lands back down? Yeah, so, you know, the, the basic idea was that uh, the company would try to use airline or aircraft-like technologies as much as possible. Mm -hmm. So, you know, for the first um, 50,000 feet and the last 50,000 feet, it was just, you know, using wings, right? Literally, jet aviation is the safest form of uh, transportation, I think, that you can take on the planet. And so the idea was, let's use that. It's cheapest and um, safest for the first bit and the last bit. And then you would use rocket technologies for the uh, the middle bit for going to space. Um, mm -hmm. And the idea was that that would, the combination of that, at least the idea was that that was going to be um, relatively uh, uh, safe and and uh, and affordable. Um, all of these technologies are still in their early days, right? Like we we are not, to be clear, you know, at, you know, flying a 737 four or five times a day, you know, like Southwest does. But no. we're taking steps towards that. And that's the kind of thing. I mean, you know, SpaceX should really be super congratulated for now reusing single boosters, you know, many single boosters more than 10 times. I mean, that's a super impressive technical achievement. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when people thought that was never going to work or never be, oh, yeah. never be a thing that could work. And now, like, people don't even pay attention to it. Like, it's not even news when, you know, the hundredth SpaceX booster lands safely on a on a barge in the middle of the Atlantic. Like, that's just crazy um, that that's made, we made that change. This concept of taking a plane to 50,000 feet and then launching a rocket from it, does the maths work out to do that, but go all the way into, like, an orbital space or, like, just... Just get out, get out of the Earth's uh, gravity well completely, or is, or does it is that too hard in terms of like the masses and? We can do it, and in fact, a different Virgin company called Virgin Orbit uh, have successfully accomplished that with a different vehicle and a different vehicle system. Oh, they did. Um, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the the challenge is that when you want to get really big or get much bigger, it gets mm -hmm. harder because then you get a you need to have a really big airplane. <laughs> You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like like a, a SpaceX rocket or whatever are quite heavy, you know. And so to um, to to do that from an air launch platform would require a really a really huge rocket. I mean, a really huge airplane. Sorry, the airplane has to be like like maybe three times bigger than the like payload or something like that to like make it work. Uh, yeah, I don't know what the right proportion is. There is actually a, a very big um, airplane that has been created. It's in Mojave, California. It's the biggest airplane in the world. And it was originally created to um, launch rockets um, to space, um, big, big, pretty big rockets. Oh, really? Um, what's it called? It, so it's called Strato Launch, and uh, or that's what the name of the company is. And um, and it's a huge plane. It's, it's almost it's kind of the size of two 747s connected at the wing. Yeah, it's not two 747s connected at the wing, but it's the same size sure. as that, basically. And oh. their idea was to have a, a rocket that was not quite as big as the standard Falcon 9 SpaceX rocket, um, but something a bit smaller and, and to launch that from underneath. So, so what's interesting is like even the biggest plane in the world could not launch the standard SpaceX um, mm. rocket. Like you needed to have a smaller, smaller rocket. I thought the biggest airplane was that Ukraine one. Was that, um, there was a, a huge one in Ukraine, right? That was destroyed in the war. Yeah, huge one. Um, the the illusion. I, I think I think it was illusion. I can't remember, but um, yeah. This this is it's two, it's got two fuselages, mm -hmm. uh, the big one in in oh, Mojave, wow. and oh. it's uh, I think actually the the Ukrainian one could could maybe potentially carry more. Um, I, I'm not sure, but um, but certainly in terms of uh, I think wingspan, the one in Mojave is bigger. What were the biggest technical challenges uh, you faced at Virgin Galactic to, you know, go from, I guess, zero to getting kind of suborbital air flight with these things? And it looks like they'll be launching their first like commercial flights this year, I guess. So it's like been, um, what, a decade plus journey, right? Um, multiple decades to get to where they are. Yeah, it's, it's certainly been a long journey. Um, you know, all the stuff that you would probably imagine, you know, um, getting the rocket right was a big part of the challenge. And, and uh, you know, just 
just uh, all the different technical bits were were, were quite challenging. Um, uh, when you do these things for the first time, and then when you try to scale them up, um, it it uh, takes a lot of um, time to get it to get it right. And and when you're doing it in a uh, a, a human spaceflight vehicle, so our vehicle was not autonomous. It it, it required pilots in both of the carrier and the spaceship. Um, and so that meant we had to be super careful for every test. Uh, we wanted to try to do everything we could to to not lose a vehicle because uh, people were flying on board every time. In hindsight, would you have preferred to have made an autonomous platform, or do you think that would have added like too much work? Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think um, I think at the beginning, like when the program was conceived, which is um, you know in some ways twenty years ago. Um, uh, it was definitely faster not to have an autonomous system on board. Mm -hmm. But I think that over the course of the 20 years, like that balance has maybe shifted a bit. Um, and certainly an argument could be made that the fast iteration that SpaceX has demonstrated through sort of like learning through failure in a way mm -hmm. uh, has enabled them to progress quite quickly. Yeah, they can take more risks because they don't have to bet a human life on it. Makes sense. Yeah. Where do you see the uh, space programs and commercial space flight going over the next few decades? It seems like there's even more interest in the space than ever before. More companies in the space. A lot of innovation probably than, you, you know, <laughs> compared to two decades ago and when you were asking the question in the 1990s. So it's an exciting time. What are you most excited about um, in, the, in the space? I think... You know, I, I say to uh, young people who are just graduating from college with aero astro degrees that they are literally graduating into a new golden age, right? Like, you know, if you know folks who are interested in space, like it's such a great time. There's so many great jobs. There's so many great companies. There's so many great problems to work on. You know, it's just awesome. It's a great, great time to be in the space sector and aerospace in general, but particularly space. And, you know, part of that is driven by the fact that it's not just one program now. You know, there's, it's not a monolithic program. It's, there's all these different companies. You know, the Bay Area is filled with them. LA is filled with them. Colorado is filled with them. You know, American South, different parts around Huntsville is filled with them. So there are all these great different things that are going on. And some of them, you know, will not succeed, but many of them will. And having like a lot more shots on goal will enable, I think, great things to happen. Personally, you know, here are like three things that I'm super excited about. So um, one is uh, the SpaceX Starship um, vehicle, which is this one that they're testing right now. It hasn't worked yet, but if it does work, their aspiration is to have a fully reusable, super heavy launch vehicle, basically, which nobody has done, right? And when, the way that space economics work is that if the bigger your vehicle, the lower your cost per unit weight, basically. And then the also the other thing is if you can reuse it, then that also radically decreases your uh, cost. And so, you know, when I was um, young, <laughs> it cost ten to one hundred thousand dollars per kilogram to send something into orbit, right? And you know, SpaceX, I think, is now very close if not below with their standard launch vehicle like a thousand dollars per kilogram mm. but starship could push it like another factor of 10 down so a hundred dollars per kilogram you know so like literally you know you could go to space for you know whatever few th few thousand bucks what is it what, what is it that makes that equation non-linear like why is it twice as much doesn't cost twice as much yeah, I mean, um, like on the reuse side, you know, it's quite clear, right? So if you have a hundred million dollar vehicle and you can reuse it a thousand times, then, you know, you're just going to have an amortization of, you know, divide by a thousand. Um, on the um, uh, on the other side, like on the putting bigger, bigger things up generates this great um, efficiency curve. It's It's more like it sort of flattens out at the small side. So on the small side, you still have to have all these engines, all this, um, mm. all these electronic systems, and so like basically with the bigger vehicles, the com the underlying complexity of the vehicle doesn't increase as fast as the amount of mass that you're putting up, right? So like one electronics box is sort of similar between different size vehicles, 
So you the know, fixed um, cost is basically like relative. Sort of. Fixed. Yeah. I mean, it's not yeah. exactly that way, but it's sort of that way. You know, you're just adding bigger tanks and and maybe a few more engines on board. So well, I was wondering whether it's something to do with kind of the surface area versus the volume. Uh, I, I, yeah, like, I mean, in a way it is like it, like basically I think it's like more probably related to the underlying complexity, like the underlying complexity is less different than you might think between a small and a big launch vehicle. Um, a lot of it's just additional tankage. So, um, yeah, so I think that would be huge, right? Like if if we could, in the course of my lifetime, decrease the cost of space access by a factor of, you know, from my youth, say $100,000 down to 100, like so a factor of 1,000, that would be really huge and would enable all these amazing things to, to happen, exploration of the moon and Mars, other things like that. Second thing that I'm really excited about on a science basis is exoplanets. So I don't know if you guys know about the James Webb Space Telescope, but this is this new telescope that NASA mm -hmm. has, which is a multi-segment mirror. Um, they put it out at a Lagrange point. That thing and follow-on um, telescopes. Is that the one on the other side of the moon? <clears throat> yeah, basically. Yeah. If, if we can, um, we will be able to use those to eventually directly image other planets, not in our, our solar system. And that wow. is going to be absolutely revolutionary because we're going to be able to uh, use spectroscopy to see the uh, the atmospheric constituents of that planet, and we'll be able to s start seeing, <clears throat> you know, um, potentially signs of life. Can we do that like today, or there's something else they need to so do? So we're telescope? right on the edge of it today. James Webb will enable us to do spectroscopy of close-in planets of certain mm. types. Um, but if you combine like the volume capacity of Starship, we could start thinking about huge space-based telescopes that would enable us to potentially even see continents on other planets, you know? And mm -hmm. now that's a visual representation of our resolution and then so there would be an associated spectroscopic resolution. But like if we could start seeing like methane or oxygen lines or, you know, different things on a planet that we know that's in the right, um, distance from the sun, we know it's the right temperature for, you know, uh, liquid water, man, that's exciting, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and that could happen over the next few decades, right? That's something to get up in the morning about, because like, we could potentially see strong evidence, maybe not proof, but evidence for life on other planets. And, you know, we're not there yet, but um, that's within reach. That is absolutely within reach in our, in our, in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, and, and I and I have to say that I'm I'm really excited about the applications for Earth. Right. I mean, what uh, SpaceX and other companies are doing blue is or Amazon rather is building one of these as well. But these global communications networks are really powerful, particularly for places which for which, um, you know, fiber trunks are not easily accessible. You know, so mm. if we can really bring the edge of high bandwidth to the entire planet and combine that maybe with AI education, like we could have a dramatic impact on the planet. I saw this amazing talk at TED this year by Sal, Sal Khan, you know, the guy who started uh, Khan Academy. And he basically showed this curve, which showed, you know, a standard distribution of students in a 25 person class or whatever was like this. And then, <clears throat> and then he showed a distribution for one-on-one -on -one tutoring. And basically the distribution was, pushed over by 50%. So like your lowest performers were average, your, you know, middle performers were now above average and you're, and there were a lot more students excelling in the top category. And, and that's the promise of sort of one-to-one -one instruction, right? And if we could bring that, you know, have AI tutors or whatever, you know, combined with high bandwidth, essentially low cost communications to, you know, bring that to, you know, billions of people around the world, Imagine like what will unlock um, from humanity as a whole. That's a really exciting idea. And while it's not purely due to, you know, space tech, space tech could help a lot uh, in terms of bringing um, that connection to a lot of people. I guess you're not kind of that excited about Mars since it's not in your top three. Do you think it is like a something that would be useful to humans to like go colonize Mars? I am tremendously excited about the moon and Mars, um, both of them, to be honest. And when I was young, um, like I was, a, I went to the, if you can believe it, I went to the founding convention of the Mars Society and I gave a talk, 
you know, about like the rallying of my generation, which is, I think, technically Gen X, um, you know, to go to Mars. Um, I think it's all about what are we going to do? You mm -hmm. know what I mean? Like, why are we going? And let's not have another Apollo flags and footprints. I mean, the Apollo program was an incredible achievement, no doubt. Um, I think as we progress in space exploration, we should aspire to sustainable programs that can last, that are not just sort of touching down, doing a few missions, and then not going for 50 years, which is what's happened with Apollo. What would we do in Mars apart from like going a few missions? I, I think uh, we'd look for life, you know, um, have a, have a long-term science program to look for life. And that, I okay. think, is the primary thing that we would do, at least in my mind, on Mars. Why do you think it's that important to find life there? As in, it's not there anymore, probably, right? It might be. I mean, you know, I don't know if you've been following the science, but like there, there are apparently these liquid water aquifers, or I don't know if that's the right word, but like under, under the surface, there's probably liquid water oh, really? on Mars, or there could be liquid water. And, you know, life, like literally everywhere where we see liquid water on Earth, there's life. And um, so it'd be super interesting if there was no life on Mars, I think, actually, in those liquid water areas. And, and having, you know, a second um, planet of life, I think is very profound. Like, I think that's worthy of spending some of our nation's budget on. Like, that is a really profound thing. And we might find that it looks exactly like life on Earth, you know, yeah. in, in the, uh, like a DNA sense, you know, or maybe it's different. Um, I think it's much more likely that it's actually like life on Earth, like, you know, microbiota, whatever. Um, there's this, uh, you know, well-established um, phenomenon where you have, you know, basically rocks from one planet get knocked off one planet and go to the other planet. And, you know, certain types of spores and other things could probably really? survive. Yeah. How would you yeah, get yeah, a yeah. rock from Earth to Mars? Like that sounds insane. Yeah, I mean, it's not happening as much these days. Um, yeah. But earlier in the universe, or earlier in the solar system, basically you just had a big whack of an asteroid, and it would, you know, hit 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 the Earth or hit Mars and uh, and knock some rocks into orbit. Um, wow. In fact, the ring of my wife. Um, has like a little piece of mars in it like uh, a little tiny piece of, of mars it's pretty cheap like you can buy you go online and what they can do is they can look at this you know essentially the chemical signature of the rock and they can tell that it's uh from, it's mars. from mars so, wow, that's so yeah cool. we have mars rock on on earth and, <laughs> and and there is definitely earth rock on mars for sure got it so the theory would be like at some point when life had evolved on probably the earth like it could have been knocked in some asteroid hit and knocked it to Mars and like that might be the origins of life on Mars. Actually, my wife is a biologist who does astrobiology. I'm not, so I could be getting some of this wrong. But I mean, people have thought that there, there was like liquid water on Mars for a long time, you know, yeah. probably hundreds of millions of years. And so it could even be the other direction in mind. That'd be cool. What about the idea of establishing like a base or, or you know, a part of people living anywhere in space, um, you know, in the, in the relative near term, apart from exploring life, but actually establishing our own life there. I mean, it's obviously in all the movies. Is that something that, yeah. that you think is a, a realistic at all? I mean, to me, it's, it's all about, um, you know, utility of planet Earth and science, you know? And so I, I think what we've seen in space is like, there's gotta be a strong business case. And that business case is either based on science, which is government supported, or it could be national security based, you know, um, spy satellites and the like, or or it's got to have a commercial purpose. And so if, if there is that strong commercial purpose and there are, you know, several now, um, whatever you want to call it, habitat companies that are trying to create space habitats, mm -hmm. um, that's pretty exciting. And that could be, you know, something that would be really interesting if we could if we could get it to, uh, you know, a, a point of commercial sustainability. What would be the commercial purpose, like mining something or, or like, could the, could the commercial purpose be like, Hey, this is like a house in space or something, or that's just like not realistic. I, I thought I would, I was interpreting Roger's question to be like a free floating space station, but I mean, you mm -hmm. know, the, the world space agencies are moving towards 
uh, the idea, at least, of um, an ongoing presence on the moon. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, primarily for science, I think. Um, and I think that would be really exciting. And it's and it's a doable thing. But the, the key thing for me is like, <clears throat> the cheaper we can make space access, the more doable that is, right? Yeah, yeah. So when it's $10,000 a kilogram, that's like a pretty expensive station. But if we can move that price to $100 a kilogram, then the cost of that station is going to be dramatically less. Is there something about the moon that makes it more interesting than just a orbital space habitat? Well, I mean, there are resources on the moon, right? So there are th things that, <clears throat> you know, you could take advantage of. Uh, you can, you know, build shielding out of the material on the Earth, on the moon's surface. Um, and um, and there is um, at least dilute water and, and other things that you could uh, essentially take from the, the surface. They're quite dilute, but um, mm -hmm. you know, that could potentially serve as a basis for uh, rocket fuel or, or other things. You can also do really cool radio astronomy on the far side of the moon, because as you know, yeah. like the far side of the moon is always face, facing away from <clears throat> the, Earth's, uh, the Earth. And so you could do like really sensitive radio astronomy looking, looking outward, which would be spectacular from a science perspective. Yeah, it'd be kind of cool to use the moon's material to construct or use the, use it. Uh, I guess we've never done that before. Yeah, <laughs> people are working on it. Like they're trying to create glasses or, you know, I, I mean, fused, you know, silica to create different structures and then and then bake out, you know, some of the volatiles that could be used for fuel or other purposes. I wanted to go to, back to this other point you made. You said that like right now is a really interesting time uh, for someone kind of entering the space industry. Uh, Maybe this is like a little bit of a Silicon Valley view on it, but, you know, it feels like, I guess, capital is a lot less abundant than it was two years ago. And, you know, if you take the zero interest rate environment, like we had a lot of space companies get funded. Uh, and then obviously the other side of it is kind of billionaires funding space companies, whether it's, you know, Virgin uh, or SpaceX or Blue Origin. So like, at least on the capital side, do you feel like there'll be a contraction given that interest rates are higher? Maybe people want, you know, their investments to like have more immediate returns. Uh, I guess, like, how do you view that capital landscape changing and it affecting space? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say I'm like a super expert on this topic, but I mean, the, you know, the speculation in the, in the economy as a whole has been reduced and that's clear. But I think that there's still, you know, good funding for companies that have strong business plans. You know, um, there's this great company called Astronus um, that a friend of mine has founded, which is doing essentially small geostationary satellites that, you know, are for discrete areas. And so their first one, I think, is to do high bandwidth uh, comms for the state of Alaska. And they're very successful as part, from what I understand. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as long as there's a strong business case, I think it's sort of move from being <clears throat> this somewhat esoteric, you know, um, area of the economy maybe 20 years ago to being, you know, a respected kind of area of venture investing and, and even, you know, later types of investing now. So it's, it's gotten rid of the, maybe the weirdness of the, you know, what was associated 20 years ago or 30 years ago. So it's still doable, but probably harder than two years ago. Probably are. I mean, what what isn't harder than two years? Know, what is? It? What is not? Well, well, SpaceX like, success by itself, right? Probably yeah, it's been good enough for a lot of to to justify a lot of other investing in the space. Um, you know, I think that's you know, but but um, because it's, but people made a return on that, right? Uh, or I think they have in general have been able to sell stock, etc. Has there been any other like notable success? I know Virgin you know, went public as well. Um, any other notable successes in the space? I mean, several companies I think are are um, building great businesses. You may be familiar that um, <clears throat> there's a company called Maxar which does imaging. Uh, I think they were just taken private, you know, so somebody made money out of that. Um, mm -hmm. I, I'm a big fan of Planet Labs and many other of these Earth remote sensing uh, companies that are doing. Uh, great work and and uh, and I think that these big global constellations for communications will also be eventually uh, successful. 
I don't know if all of them will be successful, but at least a few of them will. And and I think that that'll be really beneficial to humanity. I, I actually do want to ask one question about wildfire, which is um, like, what, what made you decide? I mean, you, you're a space geek for so many years, almost two decades, it looks like, right? And then you're like, I'm going to spend my time on wildfire. What made that change? I mean, you could go into space investing too, because you, you have so much knowledge in this, in that sector. I really wanted to help on a um, climate related problem. And I wanted to find something that was, I thought, maybe somewhat relatively underinvested and um, something that my technical experience base could maybe help with. Uh, and, you know, wildfire is, I think, all three of those things. You know, obviously, it's a natural system, but it's one that is exacerbated by climate change. It's getting worse. Eight of the 10 largest megafires in California history have happened over the last five years. It is. Um, something that I think has received maybe less attention than other areas of the climate uh, climate challenges, and um, and uh, you know I think that many of the technologies that we have in aerospace, whether it's sensing technologies from space or aer uh, aerial platforms, or suppression technologies, rotorcraft or fixed wing drones. Um, and many other things, you know, seemed like they were at least relevant. And uh, uh, yeah, and, and it's proven to be the case for sure. And uh, you mentioned uh, some of the, you know, uh, work you're interested in, in, this, in, you know, and some of the challenges as well in selling to government. Where, where do you think this goes? I'm, I'm curious about Wildfire, just your perspective over the next, you, you mentioned about space, where do you think that goes in the next 10 years? You know, um, what do you think it looks like in the wildfire uh, sector, like in the next 10, 20 years? Um, you know, in, a, in maybe in an ideal way, what, what uh, technology do you think will become mainstream and um, how will governments and the um, you know, private industry collaborate to, to tackle this, which seems like it's getting worse, right? So there needs to be a solution uh, in the near term. Yeah, I mean, I think that that last part is what I would probably start with. I think it's going to get worse. Like mm -hmm. the reality on the ground is going to get worse. So my wife, you know, grew up in Santa Rosa, California, and they had the Tubbs fire in 2017, which, you know, had the loss of 5,000 homes and structures and paradise shortly after that was I think 18,000 structures, Australia, Southern Europe, you know, this is a common, this is becoming an all too common thing. And, and the thing that is, you know, there are two things that are really scary about this. One is the idea of these conflagrations that come down from the wildland, but then enter into the you know, the city or the town city, and yeah. just mm -hmm. burn. And that's that's what happened in Santa Rosa. Um, <clears throat> that's scary. I think we're going to have some really bad examples of that. And I don't know if it's this year or over the next five years or 10 years, but we're going to have some really bad examples of that. And I think that that's going to spur um, bigger change, both in how we deal with the pro problem and, and the resources that are allocated um, <clears throat> to it. The, the things that I think that we need are um, threefold. The, the first thing that we need is we need to make our towns more resilient. Um, and that is literally, you know, making sure that our houses, to the extent possible, are less likely to go on fire. And I could talk to you about how to do that. But anyway, that's one of the things that we need to do. And we need to do that, particularly on the perimeter of communities, because it's been shown that that can help prevent those you know, piercing uh, conflagrations that go deep into the town. It's the first thing that we need to do. Second thing we need to do is to uh, create more resilient landscapes, which means basically removing um, excess fuel from the forest. Um, and we can do that in a bunch of different ways. There are some interesting technologies that are going to be helpful for that. Um, but also it's just going to be like we're going to have to hire a lot more people to do that work. And that um, is a big issue. And we're going to have to, you know, pay them well and give them year-round work. and and there's a whole separate workforce area of this. And then I personally am very excited about something that's a little controversial in the wild, wildfire community, but that is the idea of rapid sensing and response, right? And so the, the thing is that on a bad fire day, the hottest, driest, windiest days, if you can't get to a fire in like five or 10 minutes, and maybe even that is pushing it, then it's going to be very hard to contain it because it expands you know, exponentially in size. And so we need to have technologies where we can super rapidly see um, a fire that's dangerous and then quickly put resource on it. And 
I think that that's exactly the kind of stuff that the aerospace world, um, you know, can help with, right? Because we could have a global sensing system. In fact, I'm working with uh, EDF on um, a study that they have going to to have a, uh, you know, some thinking on on that. But you know, and you know, many different companies could then implement that. You know, who knows? Um, different different um, companies. But, uh, you know, that's one part of it. And, it. and it could also be like aerial platforms. Like one of the things that I'm really excited about are these um, uh, remotely piloted drones that have solar panels on the wings and a big uh, battery. It's a really simple idea. But, you know, having that circling in the stratosphere is almost like a satellite. And um, Airbus has actually created this now. Um, but we need to reduce the cost of it dramatically. So we need it, instead of $15 million, it needs to be like a million or $100,000. And you could just have this orbiting satellite um, looking at a high risk area when you know that there's going to be a high risk day. Um, and then I think what we need, you know, in terms of technology, and this is maybe the controversial thing is, is it seems to me that having a network of remotely piloted or autonomous vehicles distributed in higher fire risk areas that have significant capability. So they can drop 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 pounds of retardant or water on a fire. But if they could get there in five minutes, um, you could really you know, be able to shape fire behavior in, in California. That seems obvious. Why is it controversial? I think a lot of people have been talking about this for many years. And so many people in the fire community are like, you know, I'm just trying to like actually fight this fire and this stuff never works. Um, I but I do think that actually we're getting to the point where like this stuff could be real. And the billions of dollars that have been invested in uh, so-called EV tolls, the electric vertical takeoff and landing vehicles yep. like uh, Rain, uh, Joby Aviation and others, you know, those are the kinds of vehicles that might be very um, mm. interesting for that. Like you could imagine plugging in you know, these vehicles along a utility line. So they have constant power, you know, they're electric, right? So you don't need to fuel them up and they're relatively low maintenance. And then, you know, and they could just pop out and uh, they're quite quick, you know, 200 knots, 300 knots, and they could get somewhere. Their, their radius of access within five or 10 minutes is pretty big. And um, I'll tell you an interesting statistic. We, statistic. We, I was part of a study recently where we looked at the cost to California of wildfires on an annual basis and what, what do you think what do you think the cost what what do you think the cost is? just guess maybe like three billion would be my guess i would Hundred. guess uh one billion okay so if you look at the direct cost like my house burned down you're in the you know let's call it 10 billion dollar range something like wow. that, five to ten billion so you're, you're mm. sort of right but yeah but yeah per year but but um here's what will bake your noodle. That is absolutely the smallest part of the cost. So the real cost is in two things. One is the economic activity that's disrupted by a mega fire. So like, for example, when it's super smoky in, in Lake Tahoe, people don't go to Lake Tahoe. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And you disrupt mm -hmm. the summer tourism season. That is a huge impact. And then the other one is the smoke impact on a marginal basis for millions of people. So you have you know, smoke blowing over the entire Midwest, mm -hmm. you know, and that's decreasing the lifespan of a million people by, you know, a year or whatever. And if you look at those costs, it's it's on the order of $100 billion per year, wow. which is an amazing number because it's actually sort of one to 3% of Californians, California's GDP. And when you're mm -hmm. talking about a number that's like $100 billion of true cost to the economy, um, you can contemplate things that might have a fairly big cost. So like, I think we could put, you know, this network of uh, vehicles out there for a few billion dollars, you know, which is a lot of money. But when you're thinking about something that's a hundred billion dollars per year, it's a no brainer. Yeah. Yeah. And that's it just seems like some California. I mean, that's just California. Yeah. Yeah. And it seems like something that would be relatively straightforward to test in some way, even if it's expensive uh, to test it, you know, in a region that is prone to like high wildfires yeah. and see whether it can make a difference. And if it can, you can come up with a business case, right? Yeah, I totally agree with you. In fact, the XPRIZE Foundation just launched a prize. You may have noticed it. Um, uh, the wild XPRIZE wildfire, I don't know what they're calling it, but um, it's basically to test this. And mm -hmm. uh so the prize is, I'm going to get this wrong a little bit, but they have this fairly big area of land. And 
you have to have two things. You have to have the sensing piece and you have to have the management piece. So you have to find it quickly and then you have to have something that can put that fire out quickly. So they're going to test this over the next few years, see if people have great. And I know there are already several companies like Rain is doing a lot of great work in this area and others um, uh, that I think will bring really interesting technology to this area. Is really interesting. I, I, just on the technology side, I, I, I can't help but ask. But like, how does it work? Within like five minutes, you're putting out a fire. Like basically, you know, in in, a, in um in an area. Like, is, are these planes or vehicles pretty high up, and they can kind of like swoop in within five? Because that's a really short amount of time. Yeah, it is a really short. Amount. I mean, that's why it hasn't <laughs> happened, right? And so <laughs> there's like a bunch of different challenges, but many of them are almost like um, analogs to military activity. <laughs> mm -hmm. So like you know precisely detecting a target and then putting mass on that target are things that the obviously the US military is very good at and um this is a little different in the sense that you're dropping you know a liquid or a gel rather than you know a bomb or whatever um but so i do think actually there's going to be a lot of work on trajectory management and um but what we what we know is that the closer you can get the more accurate you're going to get and um, one of the challenges with higher flying fixed wing aircraft is that you'll drop, you know, this water or whatever, but a lot of it won't make it to the ground or will be too diffuse to make a big difference. So like you really want these things flying like right over the fire and then dropping that mass right on the, right on top of the fire close in. Um, and you can do these with you can do that with these EV toll vehicles, right, because they can transition from sort of like uh, horizontal flight to more, you know, uh, up and down, we can get there quickly and and do it. So I, like it's clearly within the capacity of humans to do this. The challenge is like how expensive is it going to be and how effective is it going to be and how tightly linked is it going to be to a sensing network? Because that's the other part. You got to be able to see it really fast. Also, the, Raj, the idea is there's hundreds of these things. So like every, I guess, together within 10 minutes, you'd need like every 10 miles, you'd have to have like a It's almost a like a fire station, right? Like you have like fire yeah, stations exactly. in every neighborhood, yeah. right? So like, yeah. That's actually a great way to put it, actually. You just, it's like an aerial yeah. fire station. Yeah, good yeah. call. I have no doubt that this will become the case over time. It's just a question of like how long it's how long it's going to take. Uh, I'd love to talk about politics briefly. Uh, uh, you know, I think it's really interesting that you're you're running for Congress. Uh, yeah, obviously, most uh, kind of operators and business people avoid politics. Uh, what got you kind of over the hump? And how do we inspire kind of other people to also go into politics? I have been thinking about running for a few years. And um, maybe like many people, I'll just be super honest. Um, during the Trump administration, I was um, really offended by a lot of what I saw. and. I didn't feel like sometimes I could say as much as I felt um, because I felt a big loyalty to um, also the folks in the company to make sure that I was protecting their jobs and and mm -hmm. uh, aerospace is tightly linked with, you know, federal regulation. And there was, you know, some examples of retribution against companies. And anyway, so um, I felt like, you know, if I got to a point in my life where I was, you know, less constrained and. Uh, that it was something that I wanted to do. I think the headline is that there are a lot of really important problems to work on that I think the government can play a big role in, you know, um, community safety, you know, child safety, uh, climate, obviously, um, housing, job, even, you know, the fundamental conditions for job creation. These are big things. And, and like, I'm a huge believer in public-private, you know, or cooperation or, or like connection, you know, that's what mm -hmm. we saw in the Obama administration around space. Like if you could get that meshing of gears going between the innovation of the private sector and properly constructed federal policy, like great things are possible. So I'm like an optimist. I'm a problem solver. I'm somebody who thinks that we can like work on these problems in a productive way, but we need to be outcomes focused. We need to be thinking about like, what is the thing that we want to achieve? Maybe a little bit less on the process part. And um and, uh, you know, what do we want? We want a clean energy economy. How do we achieve that? What do we want? We want like vastly more housing for, in, especially in the American West. Um, you know, what do we want? We want cleaner transportation, right? So that, you know, dirty air doesn't, you know, cause our kids asthma. But are you not concerned yeah. that like you, you kind of go into politics and like a lot of it's kind of like 
Yeah. raising money and like trying to get like alignment like things that don't actually like drive to those outcomes but like kind of like much worse work uh 100 percent, and like it is completely true i am absolutely astounded at the system that we have i don't know if the word created the, the system that has emerged you mm-hmm. know i mean we have created a, a class of legislators who are essentially telemarketers for uh tv stations And um, that is crazy to me, right? Like the common expectation is that you're going to spend 70, 80 percent of your time fundraising. Yeah, that's insane, insane. And and, and not just that, but like, you know, you're making these these successful challenger candidates. You know how many calls they're making over the course of a, you know, cycle? Like 20,000. Yeah, (laughs) 20,000. Yeah. Like, I mean, you know. You know, you're meeting these like goals around, you know, did you make 40 calls an hour? You right. know, and how many, you know, it's like, it's like telemarketing. But the solution is, I mean, it's kind of like, I, I like to make the joke, like, you don't want to, no, not everybody can run away from the burning building. You know, we got to have some people who run towards the burning building and do campaign finance reform or whatever, you know, the thing that needs to fix the system. Because right now we're in a system where any, I'm probably going to, you know, regret saying this, but like, you know, most rational people will not go into politics because it is terrible from a life. You know, you know, you're going to have to raise money all the time. You know, you're going to put your family at risk from crazies uh, and you're concerned that you're not going to get enough done, which is, you know, fundamentally what you're saying, Ahmad, right? You know, like yeah. what's the useful time per year that you're actually doing work that you came to? And I think that that right now is too low. Like, no question, it's too low. But like the solution is not to like, or a solution is not to run away from it, but it is to try to fix it so that, you know, we get more good people. And part of the rationale for me running is I think we need more people who are, you know, at least somewhat conversant in technology and innovation. And, you know, uh, how do you how do you help the business sector work well to get good jobs for people and, uh, you know, win win. Um, and uh, yeah, I think we need more people like that. And although I have nothing personal against lawyers, we could probably do with less lawyers in Congress, right? Like it's the it mm-hmm. is the number one profession by a huge margin. And having more entrepreneurs, scientists, engineers, um, and other flavors of professions, artists, I don't know, you know, would probably be healthy for our nations. I mean, I would love that too. It just feels like there's only so many people willing to I guess, like sacrifice <laughs> the things that you're willing to sacrifice to do it. And it would be nice. If yeah, I applaud required. that. It's, it's really impressive that. that you're willing to, you know, um, do this and represent technology um, in government that, that we definitely need more of that. Why, why the legislative branch versus executive branch? I mean, you, you know, you were a chief of staff at NASA before. It feels like you could easily get a senior position in, in the government, you know, with the executive responsibility. Um, you know, being a legislator is a, is a very different game. Um, why, why do you decide to do that? Um, part of the reason was that I had already done the executive branch and I c- kind of felt like I knew that. And, and, you know, when you're in the executive branch, you know, you have significant influence over a narrow scope of human activity or a relatively narrow scope of human activity. Mm-hmm. I think as a legislator, you have maybe less um, deep uh influence maybe but you have a broader scope of activity right so you Mm -hmm. can be working on social policy technology policy you know budgets international affairs you know so you can get involved in in a wider span of things and to me on a personal level that was that was interesting what does congress have today in terms of technology legislation i mean we've, we've seen some of these like interviews they do of technology ceos and some of them are laughable right like you know they they know so little about how technology works what sort of committees do they have? What kind of structures do they have to educate themselves on the latest technology? I mean, these are people making decisions on laws, you know, for our country that that have a massive impact to our economy and, and to the well-being of our people. Just curious, what is out there today and what would you hope to put in place or help put in place or help influence when, you know, in, in the seat? Yeah, I mean, ostensibly, you know, the committee structure in Congress, you know, encompasses the whole of human activity, right? You know, and depending mm-hmm. on your thing, you know, the CHIPS Act came out of one piece and, you know, y- you know, you have some committees which are authorizing committees like the Science Committee, you know, which will set out the authorizing legislation for different bodies like NASA. And it'll say, like, here's the things that we want NASA to do. And then you'll have the appropriators 
jump in. But I think what you're getting at is a deeper point, which is like, how do legislators educate themselves on the most important issues of the day? For example, AI. And, you know, ostensibly one way they can do that is through hearings, you know, and if those hearings were actually less performative and more substantive, like that actually would probably be good. Right now, a lot of these hearings are performative because the way that you raise money is you get a viral video clip of you fighting with somebody <laughs> and then you can go raise, you know, $50,000 off of that clip, which is one of the things that is causing the system to kind of spiral out into a non-productive way. So we need to figure out ways to do that. Another thing that we need to do is, you know, think about how we are retaining really great staff inside Congress, because right now a lot of staff, and this, is, this is a generalization, there are some people who stay for a while, but a lot of people are, you know, younger people in their 20s, and then they'll go on to something else later. And so what happens is that the repositories of ongoing knowledge become maybe the legislators, but also the lobbying class who are the ones who persist, you know, across administrations and through different terms of Congress. I think we need more knowledge inside of um, uh, Congress, more longer term staff. We need to figure out how to compensate those people, you know, in a way that's commensurate with their experience so that we can have really excellent, you know, technology experts who can help members of Congress, um, you know, learn. I will give you one hopeful example. There's a guy named Don Byer, and I think he's in his 70s. I could be wrong. Uh, he was a successful entrepreneur from Virginia. And now he's a member of Congress, but he's gone back to school to basically get a degree in artificial intelligence um, while he's in Congress. And, and he's doing that because he thinks that this is arguably the most technology, most important technology that, uh, you know, is coming down the path and, and that Congress needs some people who understand that. So th it's not all bleak. There are some really good people in Congress. It's just that they sort of get um, outshouted by um, the more performative members of the legislature. I'm glad that uh, hopefully you could add to that, um, you know, knowledge base that Congress has because um, they certainly need it. You know, just for the record, I will say if anybody, you know, supports sort of, you know, fact based governance in Congress, they can go to our website, which is georgewhitesides.com and they can, you know, make a contribution or they can volunteer to join. There are going to be a lot of people in L.A. or in California who, you know, this is the this is the seat that is. Um, uh, the closest to L.A., um, where um, folks who are, you know, of the Democratic side, you know, can make a big impact. So is it an open seat or are you fighting an incumbent? It's an incumbent. There's an incumbent there. It's an incumbent, but I believe it was like a, it was a Joe Biden seat in 2020, right? And then it was um, it was one of the it, it was a narrow, I think, um, seat in 2022. Is that right? Yeah, that's basically right. So like it, it, Biden the people of this district uh, voted for Biden by 12 points over Trump. So it's the third, I think the third most pro Biden or yeah, pro Biden district in the country that's held by a Republican. So it's a, it's an important pickup opportunity for the Democratic Party uh, to um, take the majority in the House. And where's the region again? Like, um, what's the geography? It, it's the north side of uh, LA County. So it goes from Santa Clarita up to Lancaster. So it goes up and over those mountains that, you know, uh, if you're flying into L.A., you see those mountains on the to the uh, to the north. Um, it's sort of Great. through those mountains up to the Mojave Desert on the other side. Antelope Valley. Great. Yeah. And anyone can donate. You have to be a California resident or. No, nope, anybody can donate, you know, uh, U.S. Um, U.S. persons. And uh, uh, yeah, you can just go online and you know, jump, jump on board the train and it's going to be an exciting campaign. Sounds great. And, and the calendar is, must be a primary before the election, right? Yeah, there's a, there's an elect, there's a primary in March and then the general election is in, um, uh, November of 2024. Well, we yeah. wish you all the best. I mean, we're really yeah, impressed with your background and, um, and all, you know, the knowledge you've accumulated in so many different areas. Uh, you know, you've had a great career and, uh, cheering, cheering you on, you know, I think, um, as you, you know, try to take that and try to, you know, help influence policy as well. So yeah, thank you, George. This was great. We learned a ton and just really impressed with the career you've had and all the different areas where you've become uh, so knowledgeable about and, um, you know, hoping that you can bring that knowledge to Congress and, um, you know, we all can benefit now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Great to be with you.